So uh, welcome to How to Fix the Broken FCC. My name is Joel Kelsey. I work for Free Press. I'll be the moderator for this session. Um, and, and I want to start by introducing our panel, but I also just want to put a couple logistical notes up front. Um, we'll be passing out note cards uh, throughout the session. If you have any questions for the panelists at the end, um, I'll, I'll be reading those questions off the note cards. So uh, please, please print them legibly if you can. Um, and we have volunteers in the back of the room. Um, raise your hand if you can. And they'll be kind of distributing them throughout the crowd and then collecting them as the, as the session goes on uh, and, and dumping them all off up here at the end of the session. Um, so I'll start with, uh, directly to my right, Chris Libertelli is the Senior Director of Government and Regulatory Affairs for Skype. He represents the Skype community before governments throughout the Americas from Ottawa to Sao Paulo. And before Skype, he was senior legal advisor to Chairman Michael Powell at the FCC. And before that, he held a number of senior positions at the FCC, um, both at the commission and afterwards. He's been really a central figure in crafting strong net neutrality rules uh, to protect the open internet. Uh, next to him is, is Jonathan Askin. He's a law professor at Brooklyn Law School. He has a decade of experience in media and communications policy. He provides counsel and strategic advice uh, for companies that build and develop networks and internet applications. He was a senior attorney at the FCC and the author of several legal articles all about the policies that we fight for every day. Uh, next is Gigi Sohn. She's president and co-founder of Public Knowledge, a nonprofit organization that addresses the public stake in the convergence of communications policy and intellectual property law. Prior to founding Public Knowledge, Gigi worked at the Ford Foundation where she developed the foundation's first ever portfolio on media policy and technology. She's had a very long and distinguished career uh, as a public interest advocate in Washington, and she's a real leader and key, key uh, coalition partner. Hey, old. <laughs> old and long. <laughs> uh, Melchia Cyril is the executive director and founder of the Center for Media Justice. You'll recognize her from last night's plenary. Uh, she has... Uh, <laughs> she has 15 years experience as a community organizer and a policy advocate uh, and a communication stra strategist. She has led local and national campaigns for racial uh, and economic justice. She's authored many essays on movement building. Um, so I I'd like to start a little bit. I'm, I'm just going to spend about 10 minutes up front trying to kind of frame the debate a little bit. And then, and then we, we don't really have very many formal presentations. We just kind of want to run this as a very informal conversation and, and debate. Um, but I thought it'd be important to put up um, just a couple baseline facts um, uh, up in front. And, and I'd like to start with a quote. Um, and the quote is from Judge Harold Green, who delivered the opinion in a case called the United States versus American and Telephone and Telegraph, AKA the breakup of Ma Bell in 1984. And when he did this, and, and in order to justify why the breakup was needed, and why a robust regulatory oversight was no longer sufficient, he cites years of FCC indecision. Quote, the commission is not and never has been capable of effective enforcement of laws governing AT&T's behavior. It seems clear that the problems of supervision by a relatively poorly financed, poorly staffed government agency over a gigantic corporation with almost unlimited resources and funds and gifted personnel are no more likely to, become, to be overcome in the future than they were in the past. And that statement is a bit prophetic for a number of reasons, most directly because of the recent announcement a few short weeks ago that AT&T plans to merge with T-Mobile and put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Um, but but I, I think that Judge Green's comment also comes at a time when people, real people, outside of the DC bubble are starting to wake up and kind of notice these cracks, these fissures in the federal regulatory agencies that are supposed to be protecting us. The Minerals and Mining Services, the entity charged with enforcing safety standards on drilling projects, standards designed to protect the public from things like 180 million barrels of oil being spewed into the Gulf of Mexico, um, they weren't just asleep at the switch when the, B when the BP disaster happened, they were literally they had left the switch and they were partying with the oil industry executives that they were charged with regulating. Uh, the, the collapse, literally, yeah. Uh, the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the events that followed that, the largest financial crisis this nation has faced since the Great Depression, it really put a face, I think, on decades-long 
a decades-long rise of concentrated financial power in Washington. And it kind of pulled the curtain back a bit on how a few giant banks were able to use their power and prestige to essentially reshape the political landscape against which they're regulated. But the banks are now thriving. The bonuses are up higher than ever, and a very few individuals have been held accountable for their ideology that, that, that really wanted to use and leverage American taxpayers and, and use American taxpayers to socialize all of their financial risk while they privatized all of the financial gain. So um, I, I say this um, against the backdrop of a few things. This summer, the Federal Communications Commission, we saw uh, use backroom negotiations with a few companies to try to get to a compromise on one of the most important policy promises of the Obama administration. Um, we heard news a few weeks ago that FCC Chairman Michael Powell is taking a multi-million dollar gig with the cable industry that he wants regulated. And, and I don't want to compare those things, but I say this because when you add it all up, I, mean, I think it means that we're really at an important inflection point. Um, when we get back to first principles, the idea, the basic premise that we need a federal agency that oversees communications infrastructure and protects the public, protects consumers, I, I think that we find the vision that we all share and the policies that we're all fighting for are crashing headfirst into a political and financial juggernaut in Washington. And, and so in the coming years, as, as this movement matures, as our community matures, I, I think that the decisions that we will make, the decisions that will fight, the policies that we fight for will really determine the future of the agency. And, and some of these battles, I think, are for the soul of the FCC. Will it become like MMS? Will it become like the financial regulatory apparatus that failed us uh, in the past years, or will it be something more? Can we get back to the idea of a strong public agency that protects the public interest and creates a more diverse and local media, a more open internet? Um, so we're here to unpack a little bit about what Judge Green said and wrote about in 1984, and, and to start to think about how we can change this dynamic. And, and to do that, I think we need to kind of really explore corporate influence in Washington. And, and we need to talk a little bit about what people in DC whisper about and what people outside of DC shout about, agency capture. Um, so, but I, I do wanna put a real quick cautionary note and, and then we'll start with the panel. Um, capture is neither easily identifiable or readily falsifiable. And what I mean by that is it's easy to throw around those terms and it's very hard to disprove. So uh, once that accusation is level, uh, leveled, I think it's very, it, it, it's, it can be a distraction from real issues if it's, not, if, it's not, um, if it's not true. And it can really be a stereotype that I think leads to kind of crude and, and gross overgeneralization. So I think we don't want to throw it around lightly. Um, but in, in order to really explore it, I think that we need to, to cover a couple of real just brief ideas to establish a baseline to make sure that we can get to some kind of common definition of what we mean by agency capture. Um, so a few, a few quick ideas up front, um, and then I'll sit down and we'll hear from, from the panelists. Um, I think there's two things. One, it's important to note when Congress created the FCC, they had an idea of capture in mind, but it wasn't the same idea of capture that we think about. They, they created an agency where the chairman can only be removed by cause. They created a, an FCC uh, that had a multi-member commission where a chairman certainly has more power than regular commissioners, but you still need three votes to get an order done. And they created a commission that was bipartisan. They were worried about capture by the White House. They were worried about administrative capture. Um, and, and we have a little bit of a different goal, I think, here in this room today um, and, and going forward after this conference. And, and we really have to ask the question, how do we give the FCC the insulation required to make decisions in the interests of a dispersed and less powerful constituency when the pressure to rule in favor of more powerful interests is intense and one-sided uh, in the industries that they're supposed to regulate. And, and that's really the question that's before us. It's not, it's not about White House control or, or influence. Um, it's about industry capture. And traditionally, if you look at um, what folks have, have written and thought about, particularly in, in light of the financial crisis, capture theory really looks at three main ways that special interests can kind of get in and co-opt the priorities uh, and twist the priorities of a, of a public serving institution. One is capture born of co cooperation. Um, agency officials have to rely on information from the industry that they regulate. Sometimes that information is distorted. Um, 
officials might want to avoid the political firestorm that would engulf the agency if they make certain unpopular, unpopular by industry decisions. Um, and, and this is really kind of prevalent in independent agencies that lack resources for oversight. The second is the revolving door principle and the revolving door dynamic, and I think this, this might be most applicable to the FCC. Um, officials and staff either come from the private sector that are supposed to, that, that the agency is tasked with regulating, or they're looking to take a job in it after they leave the agency. So they may be less apt to make hard decisions regulating that agency um, that are unpop reg regulating that industry if they're unpopular with the industry they're hoping to get a job with. They're a bit reluctant to act. Um, and then the third is comparative overrepresentation, which is a fancy word for saying the industry has more lobbyists, advocates, and PR people than public interest groups do. Um, they can, they, they really have, uh, they're really in a position to monitor what the commission does on a, on a daily basis. Um, they can get into the weeds of that policy. Um, they can distort that policy. They can kind of twist the worldview uh, in some ways of some of the folks that work at the agency. Um, and they can make their influence felt more frequently and more powerfully uh, than, than folks on the other side of, of, of the debate. So um, with those kind of just very baseline things, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of turn to the panel um, and, and see if we can kind of just explore a little bit about this. I, I want to see a little bit if we can talk about the difference between capture and corruption, um, because I think there is, there is a difference between those two. Um, but, but I'd like to hear what, what you all think. And, and so can, can you kind of give your basic definition of what you think capture means? And can we come to a common definition at all? And, and can we distinguish it from corruption? Or when we say capture, are we just being polite? Uh, OK, that's a great setup, Joel. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. I'm going to run through a quick uh, slide deck that tries to respond to Joel's question, obviously from the perspective of somebody who spent time in government and who works for an evil, profit-maximizing, Luxembourgish company <laughs> called Skype. Um, this is a data point that Joel alluded to, and you cannot do any work in this area without relying on data from uh, entities like Free Press and Public Knowledge. It's a good graphic of what we as Skype are up against. There's a, you know, I mean, an army of lobbyists on the other side of this, and if you equate it all down and you look at how we compare, it's two little people against scads of others. These are two slides from a presentation that Professor Lessig did. This is the reason why large U.S. companies spend so much on lobbying. A return on investment of 22,000% for money invested in lobbying. One dollar spent, uh, for every dollar spent, you can lower your taxes by six to twenty dollars. Why wouldn't a company do all the things that Joel mentioned? So our thoughts about capture are that conviction is not capture. The problem at the agency, to our way of thinking, is that it's the old thinking that amounts to capture. It's the cozy relationship between Judge Green's AT&T and, and the FCC that leads to bad public policy making. And at the end of the day, I think we should spend less time talking about process reforms and more time talking about real leadership reforms to lead to a policy that made, that's made by governments and not by lobbyists. Um, and I think you can't, and this is a hat tip to Harold Feld at Public Knowledge, who is constantly making the point that you know, whatever process you've got out there in government, it's people that make these decisions, and people are really, really important, and their personalities matter a lot. And so it's important to have the people of high integrity in those five jobs. Um, from our perspective, the comp a company like Skype is doing internet communications. The old assumptions lead to capture. Old assumptions about the transition from the old world of regulated monopoly to something that's more open, free, and internet enabled, which is on the right side of this graph. And it's our, our fundamental belief, and the reason why we're optimistic about moving past capture is that we, and when I say we, I mean the coalition of entities and companies that are working on things like net neutrality, we will win if we can get to a battle idea of ideas. We will lose if it's about politics and how many members of the Energy and Commerce Committee can write letters to the agency because of all the reasons we say in the bottom of this deck, which is that at the end of this transition toward a more internet and open future is more affordability, choice, and innovation. And I don't know why we have to be put in a posture of apologizing for that transition. We shouldn't be. We should look to our policymakers to support it. Um, there's a good, Joel asked us to think about what are good examples of capture. And the one that I thought about most is this, 
the whole net neutrality debate was about whether it was a part of it was whether you'd fit it, the rules into Title I or Title II of the Act. Title I, you can think of as a radically deregulatory approach that was actually started by my old boss, Michael Powell, when I was in government. And the thing that amazes me about this Title I order was, you know, typically you have to lobby for things if you want government to do them, right? That's the way it works in DC. This one, the wireless industry didn't even ask for, and they got. I mean, that, it, it's just astounding to me that that, that kind of, I won't yet call it capture, but just the momentum of deregulation led to something that the wireless industry didn't even ask for. Um, again, we want the agency to be led by people who have a North Star. Someone who, for example, on their first day in office could give a speech to say, I've gotten this cool new job, this is where I want to take the agency, and this is why it's good for America. We don't get enough of that. And in fact, during the last chairman's tenure, I think he gave a speech and the first line was something like, I am not a visionary talking about dumbing down success. Um, that's, that's the last point. I want to leave you with a picture, which uh, I think it was a partner actually sent this one around, which is worth looking at. And it's, oh, it didn't come through. <laughs> Bummer. It was a picture of the reconstituted Bell system, which I'm going to hand it over to Jonathan and see if I can resurrect that, and I'll put it back on the screen. Thanks. You, you got to show the Colbert reassembly of uh, capital AT&T to lowercase AT&T, right? Uh, so let me tell you all a sad story of temptation and capture. And I'm uh, sorry to report it's my story of temptation and capture. I, I went to the FCC right after passage of the 1996 Telecom Act. Before that, I was a civil rights attorney, thinking I was fighting the great issue of the day. Telecom Act passed. And there is, has never, to my mind, been an opportunity in my lifetime where a young, aggressive, ambitious, do-gooding attorney could go and do something really profound. At least that's what a lot of us thought circa 1996. We had this great moment to go to the FCC and change the world, to move from the AT&T controlled monopoly bell system to a competitive marketplace. And I loved it. And you can see there was a stark contrast, I think, between the, the sort of civil servant types at the FCC who were at the FCC as sort of career employees before 1996 and were largely captured by AT&T and the bell system. And those that came after 90, 1996 and saw their mission and had no exposure to the Bell system. And, you know, so you go into the FCC and it feels like high school, to me at least. You know, you got the cool kids, you got the cool clicks, you see all your, you know, all the people who are sort of in bed with the Bell companies and the cable companies, going to all the cool parties, going to the bar association events, working their way up through the system, through the, uh, the network that is sort of the, the, the communications bar. And I wanted to be part of that, just like everyone else. Uh, Though I still try to maintain my convictions and fight to open up markets and do what I thought was right for these companies that didn't have the lobbying muscle that the Bell system and the cable companies and AT&T and MCI had. Um, you know, but, but we did what we could and even I felt captured by that system co-opted by it and try as I may. Now, I was fortunate enough that I only spent a year and a half at the FCC so I couldn't be completely tainted by the process. And frankly, this sort of brings to mind the mistake that the competitors without the inside track do vis-a-vis -vis those that actually know how the process works. So who was I taken away from? I, I, I was brought away from the FCC by the CLEX, the, the new competitive local exchange carriers, the sort of the internet, the wild inter internet renegades of 1997. None of them exist today, or virtually none of them exist today. And in large part, none of them exist today because they didn't know how to play the game. They couldn't get the eternal vigilance of the FCC the way Bell and AT&T and cable companies could. <laughs> and they made the big mistake of, well, so they saw me. They saw someone like me and my colleagues at the FCC, the, the folks who came after 1996, who were trying to do their bidding to open up markets to competition. And they thought we were big players at the FCC. And they said, oh, we want these folks to actually be lobbying for us. But they didn't recognize that we were doing much more good for them inside the FCC than we could ever do for them outside the FCC. So frankly, when they lured away the dozen or so, or I don't know, a couple dozen of us from the FCC who were actually writing the orders to open up markets to competition, there was no one left at the FCC to write those market opening orders anymore. And we were trying to lobby the old guard once again. Uh, so I, I think the Bell companies would, would, would have recognized the, fail, the, the mistake of luring us back into the industry. I think that's all I need to say preliminarily about temptation and capture and the process. I assume we're going to talk about the current FCC and historical analogies, because I do have some thoughts on the, you know, how things went from, you know, 
why Julius Janikowski is probably no Reed Hunt yeah. today and how we might need someone like Reed Hunt who may not be lovable, but he knew how to get the job done. No, he is not, love he is not lovable. He was on my board for 10 years, but he is, was a great FCC chairman and a very, very brilliant man. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Gigi Sohn from Public Knowledge. And um, I'm really excited that we're going to spend the next 75 minutes fixing the FCC. We're going to do it in 75 minutes. I'm very excited. I've been trying for 20 years to do it um, and failing. So um, I hope we will talk about solutions and not just piss and moan, although I do love to piss and moan. <laughs> So <clears throat> I vigorously agree with uh, my colleagues to the left here, although I do want to say one thing. I don't think, I don't think this is going to make it a debate, but I think it's important to say that the vast majority of people that work at the FCC are very, very hardworking civil servants. And a lot of them will never see you know, the light of day in a private uh, company or anywhere else. They will work there their entire lives. Uh, and, you know, our taxpayer dollars are well spent on the vast majority of them. And I will ag vigorously agree with Chris Libertelli that the way you get to a better FCC ultimately is through leadership. And we've not had that and we certainly don't have it now. And, you know, the saying goes, the apple rots at the top. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, unfortunately we, we don't have the leadership of the FCC right now that's going to get us the kind of policies that we want. But let me talk a little bit about agency capture because I think it's, I think you put your finger on it, Joel, about a lot of the problems and maybe I'm just saying, it in, saying the same thing in a different way. But I think the reason you have people in agencies, even those that will see, will never go work for a private industry their whole lives, you know, will come out with a 20 and 30 and 40 year at the FCC badges, is that there's a familiarity with the gazillion lobbyists there, okay? And, and we can't lump industry all together, right? Chris works for industry. You know, our friends at Google and eBay, they all work for industry. But it's the regulated industries, okay, the ones that have been around for 100 years and have been regulated for 100 years, they're the ones with the armies of <laughs> lobbyists. And they build relationships with the folks in the bureaus. Uh, you know, it's, it's not even at the, the, the top levels, okay? It's the folks in the bureaus, the ones that do the license renewals and the ones that give waivers of the FCC's rules. And, the, and you know, the, the stuff that we don't talk about, it's not net neutrality, it's, it's the less sexy stuff, yet it's still the stuff that makes a difference when, it, when you're talking about ensuring that you know, broadcasters uh, do their public duty, that, that they get their license for, or that you know, telecommunications providers serve people with reasonable rates. It's the folks in the bureaus and they, and they form relationships and they see the same people over and over and they do go to bar events. I don't mean bar where you drink, I mean you know, bar where a bunch of lawyers hang out. So bar events and other events. So they, get to, they may even have dinner with these folks or be longtime friends. So it's that kind of relationship and familiarity, that's what breeds agency capture, which I would define as you know, somebody in government who you know, despite facts otherwise will be more likely than not to go along with the, regulate, the position that the regulated industry uh, is, is spouting, essentially. So they, you know, despite any fact in front of them that shows that their friend in the regulated industry she should lose, they'll still say, well, you know, I'll still go the other way. And that, that to me, is, is the problem with agency capture. And, and the revolving door is also a problem. I mean, the, again, even, even though a lot of folks won't ever leave the FCC or they'll go to another government job. There are folks, polit uh, particularly in the political areas, those that don't have guaranteed civil service jobs, they're going to be looking to go to industry. You know, they just had a family. They're going to be looking to make a lot of money. And in cases like that, you're going to be disinclined to do something that might upset a future employer. It's, it's absolutely the case, and I think, you know, I think it's worse in the FCC than in other uh, other agencies. The FTC, I think, is a, a better example uh, of an agency that isn't so subject to agency capture, although they don't do the kind of rulemakings and policy that the FCC does. So it's, it's very, very complicated. Uh, I do have some suggestions maybe when we get to the suggestion portion about how we can make things better, but I do think the thing that I'm going to say over and over almost ad nauseum on this panel is that leadership is critical and we have to demand FCC leadership uh, the kind of FCC leadership that we want. You know, people say you get the government you deserve. 
Okay? Well, we have to start telling the White House that the FCC is an important agency and we want leadership that leads to an open and democratic media. Well, I learned the term industry capture about two weeks ago, and yet I still have thoughts on the matter, <laughs> interestingly. So um, I'm going to try and offer you, you know, my thoughts as someone who um, goes to the FCC, brings with me uh, comrades and colleagues and community members to talk to the FCC. Let me ask you a question. How many people in this room have ever spoken to an FCC commissioner at the FCC in their office? Raise your hand, please. All right, so it's a good number of people in here. How, how do you think you compare to the general population? <laughs> yeah? About the same? I don't think so. Um, for the most part, most people never talk to the FCC. They don't know what the FCC is. Those ac that acronym doesn't really mean anything uh, and, you know, to them. So I want to talk about something here, about the difference between capture and context. So, you know, um, capture, the way it sounds, right, it sounds like somebody did something to you, you know? Slavery, I came and got you from your country and I captured you and I took you. But context assumes that there is actually a systemic problem, a machine that operates on its own, that has its own driving force, and that actually can't be changed simply by shifting the individuals in the circumstance. So I want to suggest that, that we're talking about a, a structural problem, that we're talking about a historic problem, um, that we're talking about uh, a couple of things. So let's start there, right? I think that we have a problem of, of, uh, of context and that capture is the result of a set of systems and a result of a machine that is in place. So let me start with that. The second thing <clears throat> is let's talk about the idea that Joel first laid out, cooperation. And I want to throw out another word that may mean something slightly different but it's connected to his uh, point called uh, dependency. So I don't think so much that, so we talked about, so you talked about cooperation and how uh, the FCC needs to be able to, needs the cooperation of industry in order to function. I'd like to suggest that because of the this, this systemic problems, it actually is dependent upon industry to function in some ways, and that that is different than cooperating with industry. If you depend upon industry for your data, right, and if those are the only places from which you can get the kind of data you need to make certain types of decisions, then the data you get is going to be skewed in the favor of industry, and therefore you're going to make decisions that favor the industry. So I think second problem, we have a problem of dependency, not so much a problem of cooperation. Third, if you are a felon, um, in most states in the country, you lose your right to vote. Um, that's a horrible thing, and I think it should be changed. If you steal from a bank, you probably can't go work in a bank. But if you steal from the people of the United States through being, um, you know, through massive profits and lack of not being taxed and all of that, you can certainly go work in the industry that you just were a part of. You can just, you can regulate that industry. Now, I think that this question of capture, right, it's a problem in that, you know, why should people who have committed a crime, uh, who are regular human beings, you know, who don't have any money, they, there are, they, there's a systemic or structural barrier from you going to work in that same agency or same, you know, industry. But if you, um, because it is legal, essentially, to make these billions of dollars and not contribute anything back to the country through taxes and all of that, because that is a legal process, there is no barrier between you then going to work um, at the FCC if, from being in telecommunications. Now, I think that that's a problem, um, and I think the issue, you know, is about legal versus illegal. The question that you asked, Joel, was the difference between co corruption and capture. And I'd say that there's a thin line. Um, it's a very thin line, and it's really a question between what's illegal and what's illegal, what's a, what's a legal practice that is, um, that's, that still causes harm, 
versus what is an illegal practice that causes harm, but the harm may be the same. It's simply that one is acceptable by law, under the law, and one isn't. And somebody made that decision. Now, for me, I think that there are certain practices um, that result from industry capture that shouldn't be legal, you know, and then it would be corrupt, but that's just me. The last thing I'm gonna say is this. On the question of leadership, absolutely. You know, we need better leadership at the FCC. We need leadership that's committed, that has integrity, all that. But I'll say that um, I don't think that the current context could produce such a leader. That's my opinion. I don't believe that the current environment could produce such a head of the FCC. I think, in fact, because it, you know, it's not individual and personal, it's agency-wide and systemic. So there are some changes that have to be made to the mechanics, not just to the people in it. Peace. Thank you. So, so let's see. Let's let's. Talk. Uh, we're we're going to spend a little bit of time at the end talking about solutions, but we have we have a little bit of time, so we can we can continue to moan for a bit more um, on some of the problems. But um, so so we, we heard a little bit about both problems at the top in ideology of those that are leading the agency, but also um, Melkia and and Jonathan spent a bit of time talking about problems that are systemic in the bureaus, um, and and so I'd like to kind of unpack that a little bit. Is, is it the tail that wags the dog, or is it the leader, or is it both? Um, are, 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 you know, are, are there two things that we have to fix, both the culture of the bureaus and the staff that work there, uh, and also um, whether or not and, and people that work on the eighth floor can leave and go to industry, whether or not there needs to be um, different types of limitations or requirements before they're, they're nominated in the first place. Um, so, so you know, can, can the ideology of a commission staff, I guess is kind of part of this question, or its commissioners have such an impact on the place that it skews, uh, it skews what, what, what the agency is doing? Um, or, or is it more of a, a, a bottom-up problem? Um, or is it both? I'll start. I think it comes from both directions. You know, one sin that we neglected internally at the FCC is the sin of sloth. It's not just that there are 100 Bell cable lobbyists at the FCC. It's that they're actually doing the work for the staff. And the staff is very willing to accept this. The staff doesn't want to work all weekend. They write draft proposals, draft concepts that the staff essentially adopts and works its way up the chain. So there is that additional problem at the bottom. Now, the other problem at the bottom that we talked about were you know, uh, uh, the desire to be liked and respected and be a real player in the industry and get invited to all the cool kid parties. Uh, and the opportunity for employment on the outside. So the one disconnect on the employment front is, why isn't a competitive marketplace a better incentive internally for the FCC if it's, in fact, the staff that ultimately wants to go out and have choices? I mean, 1998, we had a choice of unbelievably wonderful companies pre-IP. I mean, there, there was real gold there if you went out to the industry. This was much better than 1984 when all you could do was go to AT&T and then just be another you know, servant in the machine. Um, so there's certainly that problem at the bottom with staff trying to either be beloved or employed or you know, uh, uh, doing the, getting the work done by the industry. And the, the, I mean, but the problem, I think, is probably even bigger at the top. And the big problem is, and I felt this as an FCC staffer, it's almost impossible to get a real independent champion at the FCC. No one with any courage is ever going to be nominated and ultimately get approved by uh, a Congress that is beholden, that is captive to the industry. You've got it, you, you, you vet that pretty carefully too. You know, the same way AT&T probably vetted the fact that they may get the T-Mobile merger approved. You, you, they vetted Julius and made sure the industry wasn't going to be too upset by his nomination. There were probably a couple other guys there that the industry said no way. And that certainly happened in every single instance of a chair appointment and most of the commissioner appointments before that. Um, so, so let me throw one more question in as we move down. Can, can it, you know, how much of a missed opportunity are we facing right now? Is, could a reform-minded chairman come in and change the culture of the agency below it? Um, and and, and you know, was that a possibility three years ago? And how much of an op opportunity did we miss uh, well, in the last I, I want to disagree with Jonathan a little bit. Look, Michael Copps was confirmed, you know, uh, appointed by a Republican president and confirmed. Uh, it, it's either good or bad, depending on, on your perspective, that I think you could get a reform-minded FCC chair, but it's got to be somebody who has absolutely no experience. Uh, so, so Reed Hunt was an antitrust attorney. Cops was uh, a hauling staffer, but not for communications. 
Okay, somebody with any kind of background, I could never be an FCC commissioner. Okay, there's no way. Because, you know, I have a history. I have a history of working in the public interest. That's horrible. So, um, well, if you don't think that's true, go ahead. We can start a uh, campaign for my uh, commissionership. But, but, the, 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 but the, larger, the larger point is you, you've got to find somebody who you know is in the right place but doesn't have a history because that's, you know, that's pretty deadly. And we've seen it in the past. You know, Janikowski really didn't have an agenda when he came in. And it's kind of funny. I was talking to somebody he was trying to convince to come to the FCC uh, who ultimately went to the FTC, which is happening a lot these days. Uh, and the guy sat down and said to the, to the chairman to be, what's your agenda? He said, I don't know. Why don't you tell me what it should be? So he really came in as a complete and total blank slate. Luckily for him, Congress gave him an agenda. It was called the National Broadband Plan. But so I, I think it's not impossible. Uh, but you've just got to get the right person, uh, the right person who you know is going to do the right thing. Right, but you, you reference, you reference uh, Michael Copps as the great champion. What happened to that? Hello? Oh, you reference Michael Copps as the great champion. There was a year, let's not forget, he was acting chairman of the FCC. He could have invoked the wireless friendly net neutrality rules. Don't forget he voted for, you know, to, uh, to support the, definition, the, the definitional shell game of converting telecom services to informational services. And, you know, and to some extent, he's, he's playing the game. He has to be complicit to get, you know, as much as he can get done. But he did have a full solid year to do what Julius has failed to do as well. But, but well, I'll, I'll, I'll defend him. I'll defend him to the extent that, to the extent that you, know, you know, Julius not, not long after Cops was named acting chair, Julius was named, and Julius was pulling the strings, okay, essentially, and the White House was saying, well, don't do too much. So, I mean, it's not like Cops had free reign as an acting chair to do whatever he wants. And didn't, I mean, you know, some, some of, um, you know, all of your histories go way back further than mine, much, much further than at the FCC, way but, <laughs> but, but I mean, didn't, didn't, some of, didn't some of the good commissioners, I mean, isn't, isn't the part of the difference between when they started and when they started doing good, um, the, the impact of people coming in and saying, we need you to do X, we have your back, we know that there's powerful interests, you know, lined up on the other side, but here's not just a small community uh, you know, a narrow constituency of people that need you to do something against them, but it's a united coalition of folks. Um, you know, but, uh, Chris, can you talk a little bit about what it was like at the FCC and if that had any impact um, when folks would come in in a united coalition that was at least politically inconvenient to cross to say, we need you to not to do this deregulatory policy? Um, and, and Melki, I don't know if you can talk a little bit about what it, you know, what it's like bringing that outside constituency into the FCC um, to, to have that conversation with the folks that are there and some of the obstacles that you face. Okay. So I'll make two points about that, Joel, because I think it's, so one is directly responsive to the idea that somebody could come in and change the culture and actually move a reform agenda. And the second is about the notion of a consumer advocate being a commissioner. If you look institutionally at the 50 state public utility commissions, it's very common for them to appoint a commissioner to be a consumer advocate. And while, yes, you've done an amazing amount of work and have lots of positions that would piss people off on different sides in the industry, why can't we have some political space for the idea of a commissioner who has as his or her only focus the, uh, protecting you know, against higher rates or uh, less affordable broadband, for example? I mean, you, there, there is some institutional evidence for that, and it happens at the states. The, the, the first point, though, is really, I mean, the, the problem with the agency is that if you're a deregulator, right, and say you come in and you do charter the agency on a new course, right, you, you can essentially deregulate the markets without much involvement at all from the staff. And in fact, that's what happened when certain chairs were in, in power over there. So you, it's much easier to break a window than to build one. And if your agenda and if your energy and your ideology is all about sort of a radical deregulatory approach, then you don't essentially need the staff, right? You can do it with a handful of people. There's this joke at the agency that like 2% of the agency can run the whole place. The other 98% of the people are just sort of friction. And, and I think the problem with the new, with, with the reform agenda is that it's just institutionally much harder because you've got to get all those people working in the right direction because you're essentially building up a new framework. And, and that's why I think leadership is the answer. Leadership, intellectual leadership, 
right? The, the, you know, the first day of a new chairman's tenure could be about, here are the five academics that I've been reading during the transition, and here's the intellectual framework for what we're going to try to rebuild. And here are the four bureau chiefs that we're going to charter to do the following four things by the following, you know, time frame. That could happen. That's the missed opportunity. And I can't imagine a better set of political circumstances than existed two years ago. I mean, I hope it comes back again, and maybe we'll learn our lesson. But um, I think it's possible. It's just a much more difficult task than the deregulatory impulses of the uh, 2000 to 2005 area. Well, you know, I, I think leadership is important. I do. And I think that um, should circumstances allow for that type of leadership to emerge, um, I think that, that it would still matter a great deal what the public did um, and how the public reacted and acted in relationship to that leader. So one of the things that we d we've done is we've brought together um, organizers, <clears throat> excuse me, and community advocates from all over the country, and we've brought them to the FCC to um, speak with both the chairman, um, the staffers at the chairman's office, with Commissioner Clyburn, Commissioner Cobbs, all the Democratic commissioners. And uh, one of the things that I've learned through that process is I've learned a couple things. One is um, for all of AT&T's and Comcast and you know Verizon's lobbyists and everything that they're bringing about the economic impacts and the you know all, all of the messaging around all oh, this you know if you you know if you make the net neutral it's gonna it's a really a broadband tax and you know whatever whatever they bring whatever data whatever information they bring um, tell three stories from real people on the ground in their own words and I'm not saying that it balances the scale what I am saying is that it has weight that you would not imagine <laughs> so all of the data you know um, because the data is in constant dispute is it industry data is it real you know who, who says it's real we don't know but the voice of, of individuals who are affected that cannot be disputed it's, it's there, you know, period. And so the more voices that can come before this body, this regulatory body, I think the more weight, the more, um, the more you can pressure leadership. So bottom line is this, you know, we had town halls, we brought, you know, we brought commissioners uh, to the town halls. One of the town halls had 8,000 people, what, what was it, 5,000 people? Amalia, how many people were at the town hall, oh, participated? 800, and then, 800. Uh, yeah, okay. So it was uh, all together about 5,000 people that engaged in these two town halls. And, you know, that's relatively small. I mean, that's not a lot of people. But guess what? Each of these town halls made national news. You know, they weren't just focused on, the news didn't focus on the fact that it was in Minneapolis or in Albuquerque. This was a national story. It's the, it's, you know, it was the town halls that brought, um, you know, uh, Senator Al Franken out. And then the quote that he made at the town hall made national news all across the country. It shaped the debate. So what I'm saying is real people have influence in a way that you just wouldn't imagine. But the thing I'll close, I'll close uh, this piece by saying this. Despite that, despite the influence that real people have, most people never, ever talk to the FCC. And I would say as a critique of even some of, you know, some of the uh, Beltway allies that we work with very closely, whom we need very much, the fact is that they do not invest in mobilization strategies that bring real people to the FCC. That's just not a strategy that they've used. And maybe it's not the strategy they're supposed to use, but it is the strategy someone is supposed to use. So I just, you know, that's what I, was, that's what I would say about that. That's helpful. So, um, I'm going to throw one, one more question out there and then read a couple from, from the audience and then, then let's, talk about, um, let's talk about solutions. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about AT&T. Oh, okay. Um, thank you, Malkia. Um, let's talk a little bit about AT&T, T-Mobile. Do you, you know, this is a, a merger that was announced and if it goes through, you'll have two companies with close to 80% of the market share in the wireless space. Um, 
that seems to me to be a number that's hard to cover up, even with all of AT&T's campaign cash. Um, so, you know, what's, what, what's the likelihood that, that this goes through? Um, what's the likelihood that the FCC takes, takes an interesting look at it? Um, and, and would they have ever announced this merger had a Michael Copps or a Mignon Clyburn been at the helm and, and not Julius? Well, I'll take that one. I mean, I think numbers don't lie. Uh, and even in the very early stages, AT&T and T-Mobile haven't even applied yet with any of the regulatory agencies to have their merger approved. You're seeing uh, indexes that you use in antitrust law. They're called Hirsch, Herfindahl Hirschman indexes, or Hirschman Herfindahl, I never remember, uh, where eight, the number 1,800 means concentrated. And you're seeing in some markets like 3,000 and 2,300. I mean, the, the numbers don't lie. Uh, you know, Free Press has a great uh, briefing paper that shows what concentration of the top two and top four entities in the oil and banking and airline industries would look like compared to uh, what the concentration would be in this industry, in the telecom industry. And it's like, this would be double of what's in the airline oil. I mean, those kind of numbers don't lie. I think this is going to get incredible regulatory scrutiny. I don't think the FCC is going to be the leader. I think the Department of Justice is going to be the leader here because the antitrust case for this, I mean, the public interest case for this is even worse. But we don't have a strong FCC right now. But I do think the Department of Justice is going to look at this very, very carefully. I'm very, very pessimistic. I mean, I'm optimistic that it will be blocked. I'm pessimistic that it will go through. Uh, there was another point I want to make, and I'm dying to make it. So let me, I'll, I'll pass it. I'll pass. I, I just think it's going to be very, very difficult. Oh, I, I remember it now. So people look at the fact that AT&T, there's a clause in the agreement between AT&T and T-Mobile that says that if this deal does not get regulatory approval, AT&T will have to pay T-Mobile $3 billion. And people say, wow, $3 billion, if it fails, AT&T must have the skids greased. I don't believe that. $3 billion is chump change for these guys, right? It's a $39 billion deal. This company is printing money. But here's what they get for their $3 billion. And this approval, this process, I will not use the word approval, this process is going to take at least 18 months, may take two years. What they get is T-Mobile's out of the game, right? T-Mobile is not going to do anything to cross AT&T. They're still running their ads, yeah. which this cracks me up every time I see them. If you watch Comedy Central, they're on all the time. So, but they're not going to, you know, fight for the kind of regulatory, um, uh, regulatory parity that they've been fighting for. We just got data roaming, which is great, but they've been fighting for uh, access to special digital lines called special access lines. They've been fighting for certain blocks of spectrum to be auctioned. Uh, they're, not, they're out of the game. Sprint is also going to be out of the game because their number one thing is going to be fighting this merger. Sprint is totally screwed if this merger goes through. They've got like 12% of the market. So they, they are going to be our best friends for the next 18 months or two years. So you have totally demolished your competitor's uh, regulatory agenda for 18 months to two years. Is that worth $3 billion? I think so. So the good news is that unlike the Comcast NBC merger, which almost from the get-go was viewed as an inev inevitability, you're not seeing that here. The, the, the Economist came out against it. The New York Times said, boy, really high hurdle. LA Times said the same. I expect the Washington Post to say uh, the same. We had a very good meeting with their editorial board. So, and, and members of Congress are not coming out of the woodwork saying this is good. I've been getting emails and calls from people who are not philosophically aligned with public knowledge saying, wow, this one really trips a wire for people who are not necessarily the most you know, public interest or regulatory minded. So I, I frankly think, although I don't really support the merger, I think AT&T has a very compelling policy argument that hinges on the definition of the appropriate market. We keep thinking, you know, when we talk about this in a vacuum, we talk about intramodal competition in the wireless market. That's the issue. How many numbers is the right number in each region to have competition for wireless communications? AT&T and T-Mobile aren't going to talk about it that way. They're going to talk about it in terms of intermodal competition. The competition that AT&T needs to compete effectively against AT&T Wireline. <laughs> 
or Verizon Wireless, whatever, the wireline companies and the cable companies. Their whole objective is to reframe the market as one between pipes of various sorts competing against, against each other to provide the most robust broadband capacity possible to consumers. So their attitude is, it's absurd to have multiple pipes in the same region. So why shouldn't we roll up all of the GSM pipes, AT&T and T-Mobile, and create one very powerful pipe that can compete effectively against cable and the wireline telephony but, broadband but, providers? But how, 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 so how can, how can um, j just to drill down on that, and then um, how can the FCC justify that, right? Because doesn't that kind of run counter to one of their, you know, one of, one of the key elements of the national broadband plan, even the flawed national broadband plan says wireless is the great hope for competition. Right? This, is, this is what's going to come in and save us from you know, Ma Bell and Pa Comcast. We're going to have you know, wireless broadband connectivity. And so if the same wireless broadband companies also own the wires, aren't you kind of relying on them to, to compete against themselves? I mean, how, how, do you, how do you get to the competitive world that the, that the FCC envisioned in, insofar as they address this at all in the National Broadband Plan? Uh, right, and I guess I would say it this way, if you're a company like Verizon that's deployed a very expensive deep fiber network to a residential subscriber, it's a legitimate question to ask, what incentive do they have to build out a 4G network, a wireless network, that will compete with that fiber? With their, but, own, with their own fiber. With their own fiber. Okay. But I think the problem is more fundamental. It, it is at least, so two points. Two-thirds of the time, telecom mergers that have been proposed with this level of concentration have been blocked. So that's just the history. That's the reality. You can't, those are facts. Um, when you've got levels like this, the HHI values where they are, and even the DOJ has raised its highly concentrated uh, threshold from 18 to 2,500 now, still you're way above that. Two thirds of the time they've been blocked. Secondly, it seems to me that AT&T is not making, it, they're, they're not even buying your framework, Joel. They're not making a competition point. They're, they're trying to make a deployment point. And I think this actually goes back to the Kingsbury commitment in the 20s where AT&T went back and said, hey, if you give us monopoly, we'll put you know, copper wires everywhere. It feels to me like this merger is about, if you give us this combination, we'll deploy these wireless networks to 95% of Americans, even though the National Broadband Plan concluded that without any combinations or government support, you get to about 90% of Americans. So it's not about competition, it's about the idea of reaching everyone. Yeah, I agree with Chris, and I think it's critically important for people to realize that, that the public interest benefits that AT&T are proposing can all happen without them taking out a low-cost competitor. So they're promising a better network, right? fewer drop calls, invest money in your network, build out the, the spectrum you're sp sitting on, and they're still sitting on a lot of spectrum from that fancy you know, broadcast uh, spectrum auction, the 700 megahertz auction from a couple of years ago. And they say, well, we're going to build out you know, LTE to 95% of America. Well, I was uh, in Berkeley the other day, and last week, and I was crawling up the 101 from the SFO, and there was this big sign that says, AT&T covers 97% of the US. OK, it's not with LTE, but the fact of the matter is that buying T-Mobile doesn't get them one percentage more coverage. So all they need to do is build out their LT, you know, build out their networks and upgrade their networks, and we get there with all that copious cash that they've got uh, in their bank accounts. So, uh, you know, there's there's really no public interest justification, be that as it may. I think this gets won on the antitrust grounds, on the market share, on the HHIs. Uh, and, you know, it's just the enormous concentration in this industry. So, you know, in the absence of anyone here speaking on behalf of any of the carriers, I'd like to do it just for a second again. <laughs> and, and, try it out. And, and look, I've never done this. I spent my whole life fighting those bastards. Uh, <laughs> it, and, and this is actually a slur, a, sl a slur at the FCC. The FCC has demonstrated it, has, it does not have the balls to impose any sorts of uh, net neutrality-like or, uh, or access obligations on the wireless industry. That ship has largely sailed, at least for the next couple of years. Why can't we look, so, so our only backstop is merger conditions. Why can't, if the fix is already in on this merger, or even if it's not already, why can't we use this merger as an opportunity to do a couple of things? First of all, you say, 
if we do believe that the real battle is not intramodal between multiple to, multitude of wireless carriers, but between all sorts of pipes that can reach consumers, why don't we say AT&T, you believe in this model? Great, let's divest AT&T wireline from AT&T wireless. That way, AT&T wireline can compete as one pipe, AT&T wireless can compete as another pipe, cable can compete as another pipe. And then we can also impose the conditions through the merger process that the FCC didn't have the stamina to do in the first place. And then, you know, so, so basically we've taken over 80% of the wireless market with meaningful conditions, and then if you know if Ivan Seidenberg uh, you know eats his words and decides that oh well if AT and T can do it we're going to do it with Sprint we'll buy Sprint they wrap up the CDMA and we impose the same conditions on the rest of the country. So a quick answer to that, and then Melkia I think has something to say as well. Um, I think part of it is 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 the second part is can you get the conditions that you put even divestiture between wireless and wireline and AT and T can you get those conditions in an industry-wide way, you, you still have Verizon out there. And so, you know, justification for strong merger conditions is great, but you also need industry-wide regulation to get at some of the problems that, that are, you know, systemic in the wireless market. Well, you've but, but also, let's, you've also rendered, I don't, I don't you, want to control, you've also rendered antitrust law totally meaningless. As it is, it's almost meaningless, almost totally meaningless. But if this merger goes through, what does antitrust law mean? Right. It doesn't mean, it's, it's, it's yeah, nonsense. And I think that's the bottom line. I mean, one, I, I don't see any potential for enforcement of any conditions. So that's number one. So there's no point in having any conditions because you can't enforce them. If you didn't have the balls or the authority to make the, any, any rules in the first place, how the hell are you going to have the balls and the authority to enforce conditions in the last place? So it ain't going to work. So that's number one. Number two, actually in the wireless industry, Amalia, I don't know if you can help me out, but there's a percentage, like, what is it, one out of every $3? Two out of every three dollars in the wireless industry is made on the backs of people of color. It's made from the usage, a wireless usage of people of color. So what I'm, what you know, I don't want my community. We are already um, over our overtaxed. We are already um, two out of uh, every three. Do say again. Underpaid, we overtax, we underpaid, uh, and we, you know, we do not get the services and the, the get back out of taxes that we're supposed to get in the first place. And now on top of that, two out of every three of our wireless dollars are being used by, you know, getting by, by the industry, you know what I'm saying, from us. And then on top of that, now you're telling me that we're gonna have a merger that's gonna raise costs, lower to reduce choices, and that somehow, because the, you know, AT&T, want to compete against itself that somehow there's some type of answer out there that makes sense. Now that there, there ain't nothing about that that makes sense to me, right? And I'm a regular everyday average person and uh, you know so what I think needs to happen as a regular everyday average person is that I think that regular average everyday people who use wireless technologies need to have a regular average everyday conversation with the Department of Justice directly. I think that people, everyday people, need to actually turn their attention from the FCC for a second and to the Department of Justice now and let them know very clearly, you know, um, what, what, what we need out of this uh, out of this thing because the FCC in my opinion they're not they're not taking action on it they're not doing anything about it now it's in the Department of Justice's hands and I know that they have their formulas and their metrics but at the same time they also respond to the public as well so I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it and steer it a little bit back towards the FCC which is which is I think a good, an interesting piece because we're talking about the FCC is too broken to oversee a merger between basically, and, and, and w which will result in basically a duopoly marketplace. Um, and so bringing it out of the weeds and back to the broken FCC that can't review this merger, let's talk a little bit about solutions. And, and there's a couple cards up here from folks that, that, that actually um, I, I think can inform this because there's a lot of passion up here about AT&T T-Mobile, which is kind of interesting. You kind of see, you know, a populist message, you see an innovative software company, you see um, you know, a public interest advocate from DC, a legal scholar, all saying this seems a little nuts. Um, so, so it seems like if we have the populist movement, um, which a lot of folks are actually asking about, how can we get a populist movement to reform the FCC to keep commissioners honest um, through, you know, does building a public record help? Does going to see the commissioners help? If we can do that, which we've done in the past, it sounds like we need also to think about long-term strategy, not just in the light of this merger, but the next merger and the next big fight. How do we 
think about some structural reforms at the FCC that change that dynamic of capture at the leadership level and the bureau level um, in, in some ways. And so I want to kind of explore a little bit, this may be some solutions as well. Um, can, you know, one of the things that everybody talked about was the revolving door and the fact that whether it's chairman or commissioners, whether it's staff, they either come from the private industry that the FCC is charged with regulating or they're hoping to take a job with them afterwards. So, I mean, you know, there's revolving door policies out there. Um, the White House, for example, says, you can't come back and lobby us or talk to us about policy at, for five years after you leave the White House. Um, a number of other federal regulatory agencies do the same thing. There's also, and this is revolutionary, not really, um, but there's also um, industry, uh, federal regulators out there, the SEC, the Federal Board of Governors, the Farm Credit Administration, and they require any appointed officials to make a commitment up front that they won't go to work for the industry that they regulate for a period of years after they leave public service. Um, are those things that can help? Can we get that done? Um, is it even feasible to, to think about that, on, you know, to, to think about using that as a, you know, a strategy to, to help fix the broken FCC so that the next AT&T T-Mobile merger, if we're able to use the DOJ to stop this one, um, that we can rely again on an, on an, on a, an, an agency whose mission isn't just protecting competitors and competition, but actually is the public interest, which is very different than, than what the DOJ does. Well, I'll start with my experience during the FCC transition period. I was uh, the chief wrangler for the sort of the outside forces, the Obama forces trying to reform the FCC. And we implemented a couple really cool tools that I thought the FCC was ultimately going to adopt to transform radically the way in which the FCC determined, made, uh, formulated policy. We, in, we instituted a tool called Mixed Inc. Mixed Inc. is an online collaborative wiki tool that allows for large masses of people to formulate policy. And the better your ideas are, they get voted up. So you can get some, you know, so it's not just the, you know, degeneration of democracy. This is actual, you know, people who contribute work their way up through the ranks. And this would have worked in my mind both internally at the FCC and as an external uh, process for the FCC to vet ideas and for the uh, citizens to communicate more effectively with the FCC. They haven't done that. And I think maybe it's because those tools were just not quite ready for prime time. But I think those tools have come a long way. And I'd love to see the FCC lead the charge in actually implementing some of those collaborative tools. Uh, so that way, I think you get much better public, you know, informed public input. Uh, and not just, you know, either internal discussions be, uh, within the FCC and, the, you know, the, 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 the preferred lobbyists. So I think the revolving door has to be stopped two ways. So once is, you know, once you've left the FCC, you shouldn't be able to come back and lobby it or your firm for five years, okay? I think the FCC is one year. Okay, consequently, if you've left industry or left the law firm, Okay, I think Chris, you told me today that uh, you were recused from acting on anything involving your former employer for one year. It should, again, should be five years. You can't, you can't work on anything involving your law firm, your industry for five years. Now, I've heard the argument, well, if you do that, then good people from industry won't come to government. I don't believe that. And number two, there's a lot of good people that just want to work in the public sector. There are enough people that, you know, if that keeps some people out, if it's more important that you, you know, go and make a lot of money, then so be it. Then just don't come to the government. So I think those are two things. A third thing, and this is a little thing, but it's actually, you know, uh, it really gets my goat, is that if you are at the FCC and you're looking for a job with industry, you don't actually have to tell anybody but the general counsel that you're doing that. And I think that you're doing that and that you're going to be recused from making decisions. I think that ought to be posted on the FCC's website. If people are job searching, the public should know. And fourth, and this may seem uh, not to be a big deal, but it could be, to the extent you have people who are in the bowels of the agency and they're with the same bureau for 20 years and they're working with the same people for 20 years, why should that be the case? Why shouldn't you rotate people among bureaus? You know, so they're not in the same place. My spouse works for the State Department's legal advisor's office. They can't stay in any one office for more than two years. Okay, and that gets you away from having that overly familiar relationship with the same set of lobbyists over and over and over again. So some sort of you know, rotating and getting fresh blood in, I think, might be very helpful as well. 
Just real quick on the, I love the idea of posting the who's looking for a job on the website. Let's, can we take that from this meeting and see if we can get that going? I don't know who, who, we, who do we need to talk to about that? Austin. We'll talk to Austin about that. That's a good one. I got to say, though, I, I agree with just about everything Gigi says, but the five-year thing, if your reform agenda depends on getting a lot, as many people as you can, smart people who want to do good things with government, that five-year ban does not work in our interest. Because I, I don't think you can say that it's inherently capture or corrupt to have somebody come out of the agency who knows how the policymaking process works and who, because incumbents use complexity against competitors, right? It doesn't even matter, like, just, they just fuzz things up, right? And you do need people who understand that complexity to, deep, to unpack it and try to bring some clarity to what is always an overcomplicated regulatory structure on the incumbent side. And I just think you're, it, it's not everybody. I agree there are a lot of people that are going to do it no matter what, but you are going to lose. There's a strat of people that you're going to lose if you say you can't go back in after five years. Do you think both sides of the revolving door or just the revolving door that if you've left the industry? Well, on the, on the, go, on the left industry side, right. it's a permanent ban on, on adjudications is what I was saying, and then one year on the rulemakings, which seems like the right balance. I guess what I'm saying is the White House policy, which I think you were saying is five years now, it would be extended to the FCC. I just think you're going to get marginally less people going into government if you cut off that opportunity when they were to leave government. So, so what about, um, circle back and answer two questions, um, both from, from, from the crowd. Um, augmented a little bit, sorry. Um, so so how valuable, you know, so one of the questions is how valuable and effective is mass mobilization of people, power, and FCC rulemaking? And then there's another question, actually, that I think is somewhat related or draws a straight line between that point and what we're talking about in solutions, is there any chance of public input in, in, on FCC appointees? Um, can we, instead of, tr in, in, well, not instead, but in addition to preventing them from going and working for the industry that they regulate after they leave the commission, um, can, can we think about policies on the front end that create qualifications that limit the pool of applicants that the president can choose from that might change the way and change some of the people that end up leading the agency. So that, you know, you have folks that are, you know, uh, there, there was a, someone in the audience who mentioned a Republican commissioner came out um, and helped save an LPFM station. Um, you have more commissioner cops. You have more Mignon and Clyburns that, that, you know, listen to people and, and take, take them seriously. Um, and how can we get them, you know, at, at, at the chairmanship of that agency? Um, so can we think about policies up front that affect the vetting process, um, you know, to make sure that whoever is coming into the commission is actually has the public interest at heart um, before they're nominated? I mean, I think you, you can see what's happening with Elizabeth Warren. I mean, this is a, we're in the right place, right? We're in Boston. I mean, she's technically not been confirmed, but she's running that agency, and that's because there's been a pretty massive uh, public campaign to get her in there. So I, I do think that, you know, the grassroots can, if they have a choice or choices uh, for this agency, they can do that. I don't really think the White House thinks that the FCC is all that important. For all their talk about innovation and, you know, technology and, and open data and blah de blah de blah I don't really think that it, it doesn't rank up there with maybe the EPA or the Department of Education or some of the other cabinet level things. And I, and I think it, you're going to need to have a movement telling whoever the president is, yes, this is an important agency, and we really, really need a consumer-focused person. I have to say, it sticks in my craw. The first meeting uh, that the current chairman had, uh, ex parte meeting, which means one, uh, you know, one with outside parties, had was with all the consumer advocates, right? I was in a room, you were there probably, you know, media access parties were all there, and the cameras were flashing, and the reporters were there, and it was all la di da di da and it was all downhill from there, right? <laughs> so, I mean, at least for a short while, the current chairman thought that being, a, being seen as a champion of the public was a good thing, and it was something he said in his confirmation hearing over and over and over. The, the consumer is gonna be the one that guides all my decision making. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm, I have something stuck in my throat. Uh, so I, I think the public can demand that, and I think the, the Warren case is a good case of where it's actually happening, even though she technically doesn't have the title, but she may one day. 
And that's, you know, there's, so there's some agencies out there um, like the financial consumer protection, the, the newly created financial consumer protection agency, that, and it was crafted on things like the, the Consumer Product Safety Commission or the FDA, and, and there's qualifications that have to be met by any candidates before they're nominated. So I, I don't, maybe that's something that... Yeah, or you could say, inversely, you could say, you know, we want to have an FCC commissioner who has never spent time on Capitol Hill. Right. Because that's the place where capture, I think, is actually the greatest, to get back to the theme of the, of the uh, panel. I mean, we talk about, I mean, industry, the incumbent industry, the regulated industry, uses Congress to capture the agency more than they do it directly. And to the extent people come from the committees or work for members of Congress who then get their person on the commission, that's sort of like the standard way it gets done in DC. That's an institutional problem. And I think, going back to Gigi said up front, it would be great to have somebody who had no experience in this whole area get a top job over there. I think that would probably be the best thing in terms of people. So here's the thought. And this is because we've got political capture. And, and I, I think it's true. They, they, I think there are competitor pressures from both the White House and from Congress on the FCC. I would love to see the entity that is supposed to be governing electronic communications, do something revolutionary with electronic communications, and maybe become a laboratory for other agencies and the political process, the you know, electoral process. Why don't we have, this would require a statutory amendment to the FCC's rules, but um, uh, why don't we have two commissioners allowed to be from one party, two commissioners from another party, and the fifth commissioner somehow voted using new media tools, using some sort of online electronic voting process. I don't know if that can work or not, but a two-year trial period where we'd have that fifth commissioner who was not beholden to any party, but simply beholden to the people might be an interesting step in the right direction. So I want to... Um, you know, I think there's a lot of ideas about protocols and um, and, uh, and and new rules and, and and different systemic changes that can be made. I I think those are great ideas. I don't know anything about them, um, but I like them. I like the way they sound. Um, what what I what I what I can offer is like uh, something about the popular you know movement question, and you know the question that was raised: It doesn't really work to you know basically build the movement to pressure a government agency. Well, I, can, I mean yes, you know yes it works. Uh, the, the, let me talk though a little bit more concretely about about what I think about that. One, um, if you have, I think, what is it, last year, Free Press got, what was it, two million, you know, signatures on a petition, and yesterday, the, um, and that was a petition for net neutrality, it's two million people, yesterday, you know, the House voted down, you know, um, voted to, to, whatever, I don't know, voted, voted down to reverse net neutrality, right? So the question is, you know, two million people spoke. They said they wanted net neutrality. And yesterday, the House voted to say no. So, um, you know, having two million people on a piece of paper may not be, is not what I mean when I say a mass mobilization or, or movement strategy. So I want to distinguish between mass petitions versus mass movements. I think those are two different things. So if, I think, though, that if you can have constituencies from a variety of sectors being able to uh, leverage their voice, their story, their, you know, their, their comments, then you begin to have resonance across different regions, across different areas of work or areas of interest. And that resonance and those themes I think become more powerful than two million signatures on a petition. So that's number one. Number two, even if you do that, if you have no resonance in public debate, I don't think it goes anywhere. So if we, for example, at the Media Action Grassroots Network and, and the Center for Media Justice, if we just go meet with commissioners, but that meeting does not echo out into the media, then it's almost as if we did not meet with them, in my opinion. They may have listened to us and given us their time, and we'd be grateful for that, but there has to be a corollary conversation happening in the news. And so as a result, you know, we, we, you know that was when I got my little blog on the Huffington Post and tried to 
you know, even even though they got bought out, and you know, we'll, we'll talk about that. At an, is that another panel? But the bottom line is that it, there had to be another conversation that was happening in the news, right? And so that was number two. There had to be a public debate. Number three, I think it actually matters that additional public agencies bear come bring themselves to bear on the FCC. I actually think it matters that the Department of Education, um, that the constituencies go to the P Department of Education and say, what is your broadband plan? How will you deal with this question of the, the next generation of students and, and making sure they have the kind of digital education they need to be 21st century participants? And I think we need to go to the Department of Education, I mean, excuse me, Department of Health and Human Services, and ask the same questions, and the Department of Labor, because then if there was actually some resonance across, across those other public agencies, and those agencies actually brought their weight to bear on the FCC, I think you'd see something different. Um, and right now, I don't see cross-agency, that kind of cross-agency engagement at that level. I don't think it happens very much. And then lastly, um, you know, you have to deal with Congress. I mean, Congress, the weight that Congress has and the, the leverage that Congress has over the FCC is tremendous. And I think so when you think about public strategies, if you only think petitions and you don't think public debate and you don't think public agencies and you don't think public officials, your, your, your strategy is, is, is lacking. So let's drill down on Congress actually a little bit. How much, um, if we were able to bring all those people to bear, if we're able to do all of those things, if we're able to change the way that both commissioners are brought to the, the agency and also limit where they're able to go afterwards, um, does it matter or do we still have to focus on Congress? Um, you know, I, I think a lot of us, when we do the Monday morning quarterbacking of the net neutrality order, look at the letter signed by 76 Democrats that went to, to, to Chairman Janikowski. And that was a key turning point in, in the fight for net neutrality. Um, and that was a key turning point from the then candidate Obama's promise to, to where we actually ended up. Um, so, so how much focus should the people that are mobilized spend um, you know, really concentrating on Congress and making sure that, that that number is much, much less than 76? I just want to disagree ever so slightly with Malkia because she is wise. Um, and that is, this FCC chairman in particular is freaked out about Congress in a way that I've never seen in 20 plus years of doing that, okay? Kevin Martin had, you know, uh, the wrath of many members of his own party upon him when he was doing things to folks in the cable industry that they didn't like. He just went ahead and did it. Reed Hunt had a Republican Senate uh, when he was working on things like, you know, uh, the, uh, the public interest obligations of digital broadcasters, when they were giving out the spectrum, kids' television uh, requirements, and he got hauled up to the hill every single week and ripped a new one, and he did what he wanted, okay? So I'm not, gonna, I'm not here to tell you we shouldn't focus on Congress, but it gets back to the leadership point. The FCC still is an independent agency. You know, the Congress can pass a law overturning what the FCC does, let them try, okay? Yeah, they, they won yesterday, but the, the president's threatened to veto. They got six Democrats on, so they don't have the two-thirds. It's damn hard to overturn what an agency does. So yeah, obviously you always want to be in touch with your representative and let them know. But when, when, when the current chairman announced, he just made a damn speech at the Brookings Institution saying, I want to do open internet rules. Within two or three weeks later, AT&T bought, bought the wrath of every Republican and a whole bunch of Democrats in Congress on, on top of him. Did this chairman say, screw you, open internet is the, is the, it was the core of the technology policy agenda I set for then candidate Obama? No, he went, you know, oh, I gotta roll back. So, you know, it, again, it, it gets back to Congress as a player. Yes, they can haul you up to the hill, the chairman went and he, you know, he went back on the open internet, on the net neutrality rules. He did what AT&T wanted. Did that stop the Republicans from ripping him a new one? No. So at a certain point, you've just got to say, look, I've, this is what I want to accomplish. I've got an agenda and I'm going to do it in Congress. You want to try to stop me? Be my guest. 
can, let me let me just um I think that's totally accurate. That's one hundred percent accurate. Um I think the thing is I said four P words, right? I said I said public debate, public pressure, public officials and public agencies. But there's a, a, a four a fifth P word that I that, that all kind of boils up to and that's power. The bottom line is where what is your power analysis, right? Where do you see power in the in the con, under the conditions you're in? So in a different FCC that may not be the case, but in this FCC, it is the case, right? So it's the point is, what is your power analysis, one? And two, whether or not Congress um, will actually make a law that undoes the regulation of rules that have been put forward by the FCC, they do have control over the budget of the FCC, and I think that that is something to be noted. We did do questions. So we're gonna we're gonna actually I think give a couple. We did a few edited questions. Um, so we're gonna give a couple minutes um, to just wrap up though I think and do a couple final thoughts. One, um, there's there's a couple there's a couple themes that have come out of the panel. Um, one is that uh, that people matter, um, and and that you know commissioners, it, it really matters who's at charge, who's at the helm of the agency. And you know the the difference between a Michael Cops or a Julius Janikowski or uh, a Kevin Martin who's able to just execute an agenda because they have a north star, they have something they believe in, they have a policy that they care about, they have an agenda that they want to impact, and they feel like they have people behind them. Um, but you also need to figure out how to insulate the FCC from the political pressures that that all of the industries lining up on one side of the debate will bring to bear on them. Um, and, and lastly, you need people and not just petitions um, uh, that actually will come in and, and show up when, when it matters. Um, but, but it seems like those are kind of the themes. I'd, I'd like to turn it over to the panel just to see if you, you all have any final thoughts um, before, before we end uh, on, on other things we can do. Maybe I can make my final thoughts relate to something in there. Which, these, these are the, yeah. Sure. Do you have a question? Did you have a question? Creative tactics. It, I think Michael Powell may have been the best thing to happen to the media reform effort in a way. <laughs> say it again. I'm saying he caused this, the, the, that comment ignited this backlash in a way. So he was, in some sense, an inciting factor for the whole movement to overturn the rule. And tactics matter, yeah. D did you want me to answer that? I mean, all, any type of, uh, I think, public pressure strategy has to have a public demonstration strategy and direct action strategy. This sector is a little bit allergic to direct action, a lot because so much of their work happens in D.C., and I understand that. Part of what I think our job is, though, in states and cities and, you know, in, in places all around the country and in D.C., itself is that we can bring the kind of tactics that we've used in other sectors and other on other issues to bear on this issue one two i think that it you know i think sometimes uh and i'm just going to be straight up i think that we misunderstand the difference between the target and an opponent you know sometimes the fcc is our target but our opponents, the ones that are getting in the way, are actually somebody else. They're corporations. And we tend to not direct our direct action against them. <laughs> and so I want to suggest that, uh, you know, as a public official, 
As a public agency, sometimes direct action will not be the right strategy to use at the FCC. Sometimes it may be. But I think it all depends on your power analysis. But either way, direct action is a great tactic and should be used in this struggle. That might be a good note to no, go ahead. I, end. That might be a good note to end on. <laughs> Yeah, but do you have any final comments? Well, the only thing I was going to add is, look, there's an inside game and an outside game, and they're both very, very important. And I, and I take your point about, you know, bringing folks from the hustings into Washington and talking to, to leaders and making it, you know, part of our strategy. But I'm, I'm going to say something that I've been saying for 22 years, with what army and with what resources? You know, I mean... It, with the two million signatures yeah, I mean, that Free Press has, Get one percent of them to march down 12th Street. So, get, to, get 12 of them to, to um, uh, handcuff themselves to the front door of the FCC. Obama paid attention when Dan Choi handcuffed himself to the White House fence. Why isn't Obama paying attention to network neutrality? Gee, I give up. I hear people that need to come to Washington and start and, 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 and help, yeah. You don't think I've been in Washington? No, I think you do, yeah. Absolutely. Right, but when you, well, when, when, if Chris puts his, his first uh, slide back on, okay, that, that looks like people, but it really is his dollar signs, okay? And this is not a plea to make a contribution to public knowledge, although if you feel like it, that's great. Uh, or to CMJ, okay, but with what army? You know, if, if, I, if I, I can spend the next hour and a half telling you every single thing that our groups are working on, and that's in addition to net neutrality and the AT&T T-Mobile thing, with what army? And then that's, that's what I'm going to leave you with today. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you all for coming. And we look forward to continuing the debate.